Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone at uh, the Gulbenkian Institute. I want to thank Joachim Sapino for, for, for co-curating this weekend with me and for making it possible. And I want to thank the director of the Harvard Film Archive, Hayden Guest, uh, who has allowed me here in his stead. Um, and, but most of all, um, I want to, uh, to welcome uh, our guest. We're very honored to have with us Agnes Varda. Uh, the name of this weekend is Portrait Landscape. Um, uh, which was inspired uh, to a great extent by something that uh, Agnes Varda says in Les Plages d'Agnès, when you open people up, you find landscapes. Um, and uh, the film that we're about to see, La Pointe Courte, uh, her first film, uh, is I think uh, a marvelous example of a portrait that is a portrait of a place uh, and a portrait of a group of people. Um, it is really the film that revolutionized French cinema, um, that made possible the so-called French New Wave um, that started later. Um, and uh, I, I won't say too much more about it because we have the film like here. Joaquin, did you, did you want to say anything else before we? Everybody wants to. It's fine. Tout le monde veut vous écouter. Mais Alors, I, th I think de... that before I film, I shouldn't say too much. It's just, you welcome me. I'm delighted to be here, to be welcome. That bizarre bridge between Harvard where I went to hear where I went, for some reason, I, one day it will be Göteborg and, and Sevilla, one day it will be who, who knows what. Exactly. But gives me the opportunity to come here. I don't want to say just that it, it was my first film. It still is my first film. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's just that I wrote it when I was 25 and I did it when I was 26. And I had thrown myself into cinema without going to school. I'm sorry, not to film school. And I never was assistant. I didn't even know movies. I had seen maybe five or 10 movies. So I don't know how it, my mind put it together. And later I started to think about more about what cinema should do. But this is the first film and maybe after the film we can go back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Um, so, thank you very much for La Pointe Courte. Uh, it's an amazing film. I'm, I'm very curious to know at what point uh, how, did the film begin? You've combined these two things. is the, a portrait of this village uh, and also the story of this couple who speak a great deal and very poetically about love. Um, and there's this great contrast um, between the, their conversations and then the conversations of the fishermen. Um, and so I'm wondering, at what point did you decide to, to make a film about set, about La Pointe Courte, and then to include, include the couple? There are many levels who made me make this film. I was going very often to see the fishermen being that part called La Pointe Courte, which is really a little angle in the city of Set, but directed to the L'Etang de Tau. It's a big salted lake. And it's like a community in itself. And I used to go there and listen to people, and I found them very interesting, very warm, very funny. But meanwhile, I had read, I was reading a lot in that time, I had read among the American books I read was Wild Palms, the William Faulkner. Maybe somebody, some of you know the film. And I was very impressed because in this novel, there were like two novels. One related to, to comment dit de bagnard qui s'échappe du bagn... A prisoner who... Yeah, who prisoner. Escaped. They escape because there is a flood in the Mississippi and they take advantage and they escape together in the flood, in the difficulties. And then there is a story of a couple who has a problem among them, an abortion problem. And the way it is written, uh, there is one chapter about the Mississippi escaping, uh, escape. Other chapter about the couple, back to the convict, back to, and I was so impressed by that. I cheated, I said, okay, you won't get me. I will read one, three, five, seven, so I know the story. And I would read two, four, six, and then I said, well, there must be a reason why. So I read it again in, in its 
original. And something came to me that it has nothing to do, the two stories, but some osmosis comes, something that I don't know why it works, but something comes out of it. I was so impressed, I thought, you know, for what I knew about cinema, I, I had no respect for what I'd seen, more or less. And then I could say the painting had made some, so many revolutions in the 30s, in the 40s. You know, there was a man like Picasso existing, and in music, you know, that come to the dodecophonist. Dodecophon, the 12-tone composer. Yes, and other things like this. And cinema was sleeping from my point of view. So I say it's about time that make a cinema which is, you know, fighting for a new cine writing. So call it ambitious, whatever you call it, but I thought I, I should do that. And I know nothing about nothing, so I do it. And it was very difficult to find the little amount of money needed. But we made it very, very few people. But what I knew about the fishermen is, at that time, we didn't have the little recorders. So I would come home and write as much as I could what I remember the, the way of speaking, very specific way. In the other hand, I wanted to write a very, you call it poetic, I call it theatrical, but dialogue for that couple. Having this very simple problem that uh, after some years, let's say five from five years, I don't remember what I had in mind for them. Well, something is difficult in the couple. It doesn't work like it does. Are they more or less in love or not? And the man, ill, he never had a name. He is from that village, Pointe Court. He has been raised there. And she never came, she, she's from Paris. And she decided to come to visit him. And again, when you spoke about the landscapes, he had the feeling that if she doesn't see, she doesn't discover what is his own landscape, she will never understand him and love him. So decided to come. She decides to come. So it's a way that he takes her around where he used to be when he was young. And then we stop and we have the fishermen problem. They have problem about how, how they are low to fish, is the water polluted or not, I mean. And I had organized families by using all the person that I met, and that's where you say that in the village you went, you, you knew some people, then you started to cast them the same way I knew all these fishermen and their families, and I said, okay, you play the mother, you play the son. It was fake when we did, but, uh, the, you know, the brother was picking, playing the whatever. I used the old couple because they were the grandparents anyway, but then I organized something. And they accepted to play, which was incredible. They accepted to play. But we didn't have the money for the sound. So we did like we could, not, not even a little recorder. So later we had to dub it, which I feel bad about, but that's the way it is. We couldn't go and ask them to dub themselves. It would have been too much difficult. So we had actors, oh, you know, mm -hmm. more or less actors, but knowing the dubbing system and doing the, their best with a small, a small accent that some people have. But when I showed the film to the Fishman family, they were mad because of the voices were not exactly their own voice. Mm -hmm. But maybe you don't know it, but I feel always sorry about that, that we could not afford to have their real sound. Mm -hmm. That would have been better. Well, as for the couple, it was easy to dub themselves because they were used to it. So my idea was to really put the two words, two words, juxtapose, not trying to make them, it's just the same place. But there is a world of the fishermen and their family and their problem. And a child who dies and etc. And there is that couple out of the time trying to explain what is love, what is not love. And they are like out of the world speaking about that. And I always had the feeling that in, in one person's life, it's difficult to put together the intimate and the collective. Like you can be very involved with a strike, with a union and work, and that. but in the same time, you cannot really think about you're in love, you want to do this and that. Always had the feeling that has to be juxtaposed in somebody's life. So 
the film would not try to mix the thing, you know. It's the same set, it's the same landscape, but for the fishermen, it's just where they live. And for that couple, I used the images of that landscape as a kind of parallel of what they say, a kind of illustration or metaphor of what they say. So it's like reversing the landscape for my use or for the normal use. So that was the project that I had. And that's what I did, but more or less badly made. Can, oh, no, not at all. Can I ask about, um, about the, there's a long conversation in the middle of the film where you, the, the two of them talk and then we have this counterpoint of images uh, from the landscape, like birds flying, uh, a dead cat, that sort of thing. And I'm wondering um, how, the, how, the, how you constructed, how you built that sequence. Did you know that you were going to, did you go sh shooting things to, to put, to juxtapose to the, to the conversation or did it happen in the editing? It, it happened because when I did the editing, it was obvious that I made it on purpose. But on the shooting, I would never, no. I, I thought that that cat, I had to film it. Oh, there is another image, much more allegoric a kind of fishing in which they have a pool and they push the pool to get the, some shells which are very down. And the way they, they behave is very strange because the man is standing, he has that pool, he does like this. And I thought, I can use it more or less when they discuss about the, the desire. It's not illustrating, but it's like using the everyday images and landscape as giving them a meaning that they didn't have, they don't have to start with. So I was playing with signs and signification, if I may say. Mm -hmm. And so it was very constructed. I knew exactly what I wanted. And I I dared to do it, obviously when the film was finished. With I had an editor at the time, not so well known than now, Alain René. And he had done some shorts already. And he accepted to do like the others have done, not to be paid, to have part in a kind of uh, cope, you know, we did something. And they were very courageous, very helpful, because there was no other way to finish that film. So it's a miracle that the film was finished and done. And with that composer, Pierre Barbeau, dodecaphonist, who made, I uh, asked him to use an uh, instrument that are on the joute, comment on dit les joutes, you know, when the two boats cross, the battle on the, on the river, what do you call it? Just oh, yes, the joust, yes, exactly, oh. jousting. And I asked him to take the same instrument, a, a trio of oboes. Oboes. Yeah, and I think he made a beautiful music that helps a lot. So I was really blessed by all these people helping. But sometimes for a first film, when in a way, it's, and at the time it was so, very few people did it. Now, nowadays, I know 20 short films made every year by helping and because that's a way, like a passport, you know, that people have to, to get in the world of cinema. But at that time it was very rare, so they did it very nicely, very generously. Then the film exists, and then what? <laughs> no distributor, nothing. There was a French critic that you may know, André Bazin, who saw the film. René said he has to see the film. And he said, you have to come to show it in Cannes. But where in Cannes? So we rented a little cinema, private cinema, in La Rue d'Antibes. My mother paid the screening. She came from somewhere to pay the screening. And Alors, André Bazin gave me names. I knew nobody. He gave me names, and I dropped the envelope, the, all the hotels, that he said, you have to invite celui-là, celui-là. Jean de Baroncelier said. So I dropped the envelope everywhere. And by the way, there was a underground filmmaker, Mark O, who had made a short. We thought maybe we invite them to see the short first. So he helped me to bring the envelopes. And that little screening, I would say 40 people came. But then I had an article in Le Film Francais, the, and André Bazin, all right, you know, a film libre et pur. But okay, then I had a, the name, a very pure and free films, and so what. So it didn't come out. And two years later, there was a little cinema theater, Près de Vavin, famous for his cinephilie. And he said, okay, I give you two weeks. 
So it opened in the Smil Cinema two weeks in 56 with no advertising, nothing. I didn't know anybody in the press. But people came. There were some words of mouth. And because of these two screenings, the film started to exist. Because you as all know that the film doesn't exist and nobody sees it. So there have been the two weeks. And from that, it builds a lot of things. I was invited and, and so and so. So it really put me on. But I had to wait seven years before making another feature, just to say. But you did some beautiful short films in the meantime. Um, yes, because René, Alain René told me you will never be in, in the movie business with that film. But if you accept some little, uh, comment did they command? Uh, like a, a commission. 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 You should maybe come back into it. So I did something about the Castle of Loire River for the Minister du Tourisme. And I did something about La Riviera, which is a Côte d'Azur, you know, mm -hmm. uh, also pour le tourisme. But they had to say, to say, I don't know if you know what it is, Syndicat d'Initiative. It's like Office of Tourism everywhere. And they said, when I make a film, the Office of Tourism can close the door because I was not really helping the tourism. <laughs> but I was joking about, uh, you know, like on the Riviera, there is a famous, famous hotel, very rich, called Aden Rock. And I start to speak about Aden Talk. Talk means fake, you know, and etc. I made a lot of things about the fact that all the restaurants, everything is called Eden Paradise. And the idea was it doesn't exist at all because all the beautiful uh, side, side of the water, what is called a border mare, right, right, right. are private, the, the you know. The coast, the... Yeah. Uh, it's private, they have beautiful fences and so, so the, the, the border sea, you know, it doesn't belong to the people. So I made something about that was, and at some point they decided to cut the end because it was too aggressive. <coughs> and they wanted the Ministère des Affaires étrangères to send the film all over. And my producer who was a real jerk, you know, he allowed himself to cut the end and sold it to the Affaires étrangères. And one day I'm in another country and I see that I made a scandal. I had to put it back. They had to put it back. Well, I did little stories that makes believe that it's not that easy to, to accept uh, command, the command. A, and a commission. Après, because I had made these two things, I made a film for myself that this one I love, a short called L'Opéra Mouf, short of 17 minutes that I made in the street very terrible, sad street, but I was impressed by the people there. And then because of the new wave, because that started Truffaut, Godard, all these people, the producer, the story I told already, but when Godard made a bout souffle, Georges de Bourgard became rich in a minute, the producer. So he asked Jean-Luc Godard, don't you have another friend, your type, who can make a good film with little money? And he introduced Jacques Demy. So Bourgat produced Lola. I don't know if you've seen Lola. It's a very beautiful first film. And, and thanks God, it's before even it opened that the Bourgat asked Jacques, do you have another of your friends that could be, you know, making cheap films? And, and he said, well, I have a girlfriend, maybe it could do. And so he introduced me to Georges de Bourgat. So I had a beautiful project in color, Italy everywhere. Well, they said, that's too expensive, make something. So then I made Cleo, which was entering in the budget. That's how, you know, things are jumping from one situation to another. And that's all that group of people have been named French New Wave, but years later, we were not a group, it was, but it's easy to say. So I'm the grandmother of the French New Wave. Does anyone, I don't want to do, um, monopolize the conversation. Maybe perhaps we could take questions from the audience about uh, La Pointe Courte. Uh, or I can pass the mic to, if somebody else has a comment. I mean, I have, I have other questions, but I don't want to monopolize. I just want to stress uh, on, the, on the sequences you shot with Philippe Noiré and the girl, sorry, I don't know, remember her name. Okay. So, uh, of course, the style is very different, and you've been speaking before about Alain René. 
and it it can remind in a way, in a way the, the the way René shot his films earlier uh, later with the those dialogues of with Anna Robert So the the style is so different. Uh, the the the, the coupage of of the, the the it's it's like very stylized. But after the, the the coupage before shooting yeah. at that time I was not daring to throw myself like I do now. But at that time I was doing every shot and with little photos and little drawings to be sure I would do that. So René, something was interesting because René was already an editor, a famous editor. And he said in a way very nicely that the film is gauche, you know, it's not, but we have to keep it as it is. I mean, as an editor, you can always, you know, cut, make a piece, jump, make a kind of, um, activate the editing to make it be more, I don't know, different. And he said, I won't allow me to do that. I have to stay in what you decided. You have to assume your own project, which I found it was a good lesson. Like, okay, we go in the direction that you decided. Maybe it's not very good, but that's the way it has to be. Because if we start to play around to make it look different. So that's, that's what he told me. He helped me to keep the film, maybe gauche, but as it was in my mind, as a project with this juxtaposed world, totally differently shot, as you noticed. In a way, I didn't know about neorealism Italian, but that more or less. Because in the editing room, one day, René said, oh, it reminds me La Terra Trema, the Visconti. And I said, well, who is Visconti? I never heard the name. I had never seen a film of, of Wells. I didn't know the names of anybody. So anyway, to say that, um, we kept the kind of sort of realism of the fishermen and their family, and then the very sophisticated framing of the couple in which I allow myself not to respect the sound perspective. Because sometimes, you know, when people go away, then their voice, and wherever they were in the back of the image or near the camera, their dialogue was always like a voice of, it was in sync but I didn't respect the up and down of the sound. So that was because I made, it was like a written dialogue. Like in a Japanese no, I asked him not to act. And poor Philippe Noiret, who became such a beautiful actor, you know, it was his first film. He was so disappointed that I didn't allow him to express anything. <laughs> well, it took his revenge over the next years and forever. I mean, he became an incredible actor. But, you know, he was 25 and First film, he thought he would do something. And I said, oh, no, no, please. <laughs> Don't just say the lines. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that, that's, that's the way I wanted it to look. But I was helped by landscape. At some point, they have a difficult conversation about uh, who is suffering more, or who is suffering. And I'm sitting on these pieces of food, and I've noticed that cats were coming a lot. And it's very interesting while they speak, the cats are just, you know, griff le bois. They're scratching, yeah. scratching. And another one is screech. It's like something interesting as, as if the conversation is scratching each other. And I was helped by these cats, really. They do the scene, you know, more than the actors. Poor actors, I, I want them to forgive me. But you, you were, before you start filming, you were a photographer. Uh, how did it influence the film? Well, because I was a photographer, I knew how to frame. If I, we can discuss the frame, but they were a very precise frame. Sometimes I'd made photos before and say it should look like this. And sometimes with the chef operator, the DP, who was the old man of the company, 31 years old. Uh, he had been never DP. He had been a frame, a cadreur, cadreur. Dans un film de Kayat, he was famous because he had made a camera in which he was going down the stairs, keeping the camera. At that time, it was something so new that he had dared to go down the stairs with a camera. Can you believe? No. Well, anyway, so Stan said, okay, I come, but I have to take my wife. So we rented one house for everybody. So there was a room for Stan and his wife, a room for Philippe Noiret, a room for Sylvia Montfort. And all the other were two by two, and I was in the garage 
I made a bed in the garage and had a, a very transparent veil to escape the scorpion, come on, the scorpion. Wait, so I would put the thing and then make around my mattress to be sure I wouldn't be eaten in the night. So uh, it was very, and there was somebody cooking for us. They had no day expense, no restaurant, no hotel. You know, a woman was cooking cheap food. And then and at midday, we had just a sandwich. So they have been so courageous that when I think about the film, I always think about them more than my project, um, the structure of the film, the, well, what I had in mind. I was helped to do it. And so interesting that if you have a specific project and you can achieve it in its project, in its own whatever it is. So I felt good. Even the film never made money back enough to pay everybody. It's a famous film, but it had maybe of a, by the way, it's uh, Sengon Cat. 60 years this year. 60 years that I made that film, and it never made the money back of what it costed. So the poor, the others, were supposed to get the money back by the incomes. After 10 years, I did, I paid them what have been, what had, would have been their salary. Plus trois, plus trois, fois trois. So that at least they get something out of it. The first time that I sold it to TV, I paid them that. I knew they wouldn't come, and very little money came. We rent a film here, there, but it's just a film who never made money, but is, it is studied in different places, for what I know. Yes. So. Is that a future that you have to offer to people? No. Exactly. They, they were paid back by gaining a place in, in film history. Oh, I don't think Noiret needed me to, but, but that's the way it was it, like this. And I've been helped by a young guy called Carlos Villardebeau, who was doing very beautiful short films. And he's the one who pushed his, don't, don't be afraid. And he would, he would uh, deep, if, if, if director of the production, it would push the right, because we did really, real traveling, you noticed. Yes. And we had to unsell it, and everybody was helping, and he would push, and his wife would bring the negative to the train at night to send it to the lab. And she was doing also script, the girl, I mean, all the continuity. You know, everybody was doing three or four jobs, you know, just to make the film being made. They did it for incredibly energy and believing that it was a good film. I've been blessed by these people, you know, because if not, it uh, would have been in, like something you write, you put it in the drawer, like a poem of your youth, you know. Right. So the film exists, which is a miracle for me. Um, I, w <laughs> I was uh, looking at the film and actually think thinking about La Terra Trema, which uh, you, have, you hadn't seen when you did it. And, uh, and actually it's quite, uh, I wouldn't say the, f the, the film is gauche, but it, it has a rough side to it, which is really fantastic. This, uh, um, and which is also in Visconti's film, which is there's something that transcends the mere story or uh, that uh, uh, fixes something in, in time. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that's really amazing. And, uh, but, you dubbed your actors, and uh, Visconti uh, had the same problem because uh, the first version of the film, he recorded the voices of the people, and nobody understood their dialect. So it was uh, so he had to add an, uh, first a voiceover, and then the, he did a, a, a version in um, in Italian. But what 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 really st also struck me about your film is not because I think today people go to film schools and that they try to learn how to do this and how to do that. And I really think there are, I mean, when you start trying to follow rules, then nothing happens, then it's terrible. And what's really, for instance, you're not, um, uh, the, the, the character of Philippe Noirot uh, is, uh, and his story is, is uh, in fact, uh, his accent, uh, even if he has this costume, you feel that he doesn't belong, he probably belonged there in the past, but uh, is not, uh, it's something else compared to the, 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 the local people. But there's no need to explain what happened to this guy 
uh, since he left the place until he arrived back, uh, d d there's no waste of time in these things. It's it, it's what it is, that, and I think it's it's really beautiful and amazing. And actually, you can. It's strange because uh, I looked at the film, and sometimes I don't see only things looking backward, but things that came after, like in those shots when. Uh, they're in profile and she's facing the camera. I look, uh, it that's looks like Bergman. Uh, that's a fact. Yeah, probably, so probably uh, it goes back and back. So uh, it's, it's... Uh, some drawings of Park. Yes, know, yes. Friend of five. And I thought, what is a portrait? You know, you have face, you have profile, you have everything. And it was like an image of the couple. But it's difficult when you design, is it when a real body is that the nose of a man and the nose of a woman is not the same. We had a big difficult time to make her to make her come in front because if he would be on the profile, he would eat half of the cheek of the girl. So we had to do, and it was so difficult. They hold themselves somewhere so they can they couldn't move. And by the way, there is a big line. Did you notice on that shot? A gray line all the way through. And the film has been restored by the Cineteca of Bologna. You know all, all of you, Jean Lucas. Mm -hmm. And they decided he loves that film so much, he wants to, he has a lab. So they did the restoration there. And I went there for the color, 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 come on, appel, etalonnage. Yeah. The grading, black and white. Gray. I was there every day. And then at some point, that line, if they had to correct it, it's one week of work because it's a long shot and they would have to redo everything and they decided to quit because they paid the restoration. But I discussed with Jean-Luc, I said, okay, let's, we, let's keep that. So the film, even restored, has that long, in that shot, which is so rare, which cannot be copied, so difficult to do. Well, that's the way it is. So restoration cannot always be made totally. But, George Brack too. The line. I was just to, to speak about painting. You know, I had no idea what is the casting, but I remember that I love Piero de la Francesca so much. And the, the woman of Piero are like this long neck and round face. So Sylvia Montfort looks like a Piero de la Francesca. That's why I choose her. I chose it. So the reason which they have no thing to do with cinema, you know, with, I didn't know about cinema. So I had other, other um, references. And they were painting, they were the light, there were some photos. Uh, why not? So, this is maybe a question to our two Joaquins, but don't you think that um, this film would make a great double sense with uh, Mudar da Vida, uh, because you've been speaking with, with, about uh, about La Terra Trema, but you know, it, this, has, this film has like a Portuguese dream afterwards, which is Paulo Rocha's film in a way, about fishermen and a love story within, within uh, you know, intertwined, you know? Uh, probably not, actually. When I was uh, looking at your film, it reminded me of some, not only of uh, Paulo Rocha's film, which I don't know if you... Uh, Paul Rocha is a Portuguese director who died recently, and he, he had a film from 62 called Mudar de Vida. But I, 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 now I think maybe he might have seen your film somewhere in Paris because he was in Paris by the time it came out. Who knows? So he made a film also uh, about fishermen, but I was thinking uh, of some, also of some... Portuguese films from the 50s who have been basically forgotten, like uh, um, Don Roberto from uh, um, Ernesto Ernest Souza, Souza, who was uh, uh, actually an art critic and not uh, who did not have a, a, a direct connection to whatever filmmaking tradition or something. He came, he came from painting. And he did this amazing film that is, uh, 
I think half forgotten people don't yeah. speak about it. I think it's the only film he did and it has really beautiful things that I read somewhere that when the film, when your film came out, it came with, uh, with... No, I, I can't. Can... I just showed before because another guy wanted to show his film. No, when it came in uh, no, uh, theaters, it was, it was alone. alone. Okay. Two weeks with him. Well, speaking speaking of, of, of giving each film uh, its its proper moment, etc., we have twenty minutes till Matthew's film starts. So perhaps we can we can we can we will reconvene this conversation after the screening of Putty Hill. Um, but for now, um, I want to say thank you to everyone up here. Thank you to all of you, and especially thank you, Agnes, for being here and for this beautiful film. Welcome all of you to this the, the third screening for this weekend, um, the second screening today in the weekend, uh, based on and built around uh, and in tribute to the work of, of Joaquin Pinto, um, and uh, for which we've decided to title Portrait Landscape, um, and thinking along those terms, thanks to the, because of the importance of both of those ideas in, in, in Pinto's work, and Pinto's work with Nuno Leonel, uh, it seemed uh, like Agnes Varda was uh, an obvious choice. Um, but the other person that I thought of uh, is someone who has uh, come to present his work uh, at the Harvard Film Archive, um, an American independent filmmaker uh, who uh, has uh, emerged uh, quite strongly with a very strong personality um, with three films to date. Uh, we're, we're, the films that we're going to see are the first two. Tonight we're going to see the second film, the middle film of the three. Um, but I recommend uh, the third film uh, as well. I used to be darker from last year, which uh, played here at uh, Indy Lisboa. Uh, actually, I think Putty Hill played here at Indy Lisboa also. Uh, but if you come tomorrow, you can see the Portuguese premiere of Hamilton, uh, Matthew Porterfield's remarkable first film um, from uh, 2009, I believe. Uh, 2006. Um, but the film that we're about to see uh, is from 2011. All three of Matthew's films take place in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and uh, you get a strong sense of place, I think, from his work. And particularly the first two films are really portraits of communities rather than uh, storytelling films. Um, uh, what you'll see in Putty Hill is a group of friends uh, and family uh, brought together for the funeral uh, of a young man. Um, and uh, what we do is, is watch these people over the course of uh, 24 hours or so. Um, and uh, get, there's a, um, a woman who's come back uh, to stay with her estranged father, um, who provides a little bit of a narrative thread through. Um, but really what we do is uh, watch these people and get to know them uh, as they go through a, a range of emotions before this event. Uh, and after the event as well. Um, that's all I'll say because now I'll hand the microphone over to Matthew Porterfield. Welcome. Thanks, David. Thank you. Um, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here, uh, to be screening films in this context with this company. Um, it's quite unbelievable for me, actually. Uh, I don't want to say much. Um, I believe the film will be subtitled, and, uh, and I think that'll help with the particular vernacular, as David said. Uh, Putty Hill and Hamilton, which will screen tomorrow, were uh, both made in the same neighborhood, which is the neighborhood where I grew up. It's a kind of middle class, um, working class neighborhood in the city proper, but just on the, the sort of city county line. And I feel that division is, is important. Um, maybe it'll come across in the film. Uh, so I look forward to talking about it later with uh, Joachim, Joachim, Agnes, David, um, and yeah, so thank you. Perhaps I could start by asking you a fairly general question to, for talking about the film that will also perhaps sort of draw together um, some of the experiences that all three of you have shared as filmmakers, which we talked about a little bit before, which is this question of casting um, and assembling a cast that brings together people that you know, um, as well as people from the, the location uh, 
Um, I mean, in, in this case, it might be a little bit different from On Debat au Sol or from uh, La Pointe Courte because you're shooting in a place where you also lived. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit who, who are these people uh, that we see in the film and, and how, how did you come to find them? Um, yeah, I, the film began with, with the casting in many ways. I was, I was casting another feature film uh, that was fully scripted and uh, couldn't find the financing. Um, but I'd been casting for a, over a year. And, uh, and by that, I guess I just mean, you know, seeking um, people to uh, sort of Im Im embody and imagine these roles with me. Uh, the roles that I'd written for this film called Metal Gods, which is like about these uh, working class kids who are really into heavy metal. And uh, I went to uh, area high schools, um, places uh, where people congregate, you know, churches, parks. Um, uh, I was also actively like looking for locations in which to shoot um, so sometimes the people came with the place. Sometimes it was the other way around. In the case of the skate park, I'd met a, uh, um, one of the actors in the film, Cody Ray, uh, at an open audition we held at a museum. And, um, and then we, we started hanging out. He, he took me to this, this park, this municipal park in West Baltimore. And Cody's the one with the... Long blonde hair. Yeah, and the, the, the cap, the, the, yeah. the knit cap. Yeah, he's a twin. His twin Matt is not in the film, uh, but his, he's, he's also brothers with uh, Dustin, the, the uh, kind of big guy who's interviewed in his bedroom. Uh, so it was like this dialogue that, that began with the purpose of, of trying to cast a film and, and then sort of expanded and, uh, you know, um, some of the most, I guess, Important roles in, in my mind were f like just found in my neighborhood. Uh, Spike, I met at a bar up the street from my house. Uh, I guess the only exception, or the two exceptions, um, Sky Ferreira, who's from LA, and Zoe, who's from Rhode Island, I was aware of. Like my friend An An Angela uh, Boatwright is a photographer, and uh, she'd been photographing Zoe for like since Zoe was a kid. Um, Zoe was really into heavy metal, which is kind of how I found her for this role in that film I, I described. Um, and Sky Ferreira was out in LA and like trying to make her like record her first album and stuff. And I plucked her off the internet, but everybody else was in, yeah, found in Baltimore. Uh, and so do you want to talk about the, how this film then, so you assembled this cast for Metal Gods, um, and then you want to talk about how how instead of Metal Gods, then, then the, the film became uh, Putty Hill? Well, it was you know, clear. I hadn't cast all the roles, all the principal roles in, in Metal Gods. It was a large ensemble. And uh, so when it, you know, like a month or two months uh, out from our shoot date, when it became clear we, hadn't, like, we had no money, uh, it kind of freed me up to, to sort of look at the, um, the people that I did want to work with um, and create a new scenario uh, for them. And that's sort of how Putty Hill came about with like, I think 15 locations and then this, this uh, kind of intergenerational cast. Um, so yeah, I sort of started from, I guess I st this was a sort of, certainly kind of a point zero, except that there were cast, there was cast and there, was, there were locations. And then it was trying to shape something to tie it all together. I mean, it seems like the, in a way, the, lo the location scouting may also have been kind of part of the casting because yeah. we see a series of places um, it's, and it's almost like there's one, one episode for each place, although some of them we do go back to, but it seems like the places are also very important. Yeah. Certainly for me always, I mean, I'm always like location scouting or looking like driving around or biking around when I'm writing, uh, you know, sometimes I write with a location that doesn't exist and then I try to find it. Other times I write with locations that are familiar. Um, and of course it always changes when you, when you actually are trying to secure them and, and ensure that you can in fact shoot there. Uh, so it's like a continuing dialogue that's a really important part of, I think, the narrative and 
the story and yeah, the, the way I make the films. And how much of the how much of the film was uh, scripted, uh, and how much because it, it has a very uh, it has a very improvis, imp improvised feel to it. It's all improvised. There was no written dialogue. Uh, it was just like a five page treatment. So there were 15 locations, uh, I think 12, maybe 15 scenes, 12 locations, something like that. It's what I remember. And uh, um, each, each sequence um, uh, involved a number of characters in that particular space. And then there were interviews. Um, I knew who I was going to interview and when and kind of spent the most time trying to figure out how to get in and out of the interviews. Um, to dip in and out of the narrative. Me. As what? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Maybe. I mean, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it too much. I guess it was a continuation of a conversation that I was already having with the people. Like in the taxi, it's not the taxi man who asks, but how did they get to be into the taxi? I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I was sitting in the front seat. No, I mean, My it, editor... You are the narr narrator yeah. of the questions. Yeah, I mean, we have to believe that suddenly it's an interview. Yeah, I think my, my, I didn't. I never thought of this. I, I can't take credit, um, but I think it's a nice idea. My editor felt like it was the voice. He always said it was like kind of like the voice of the frame, which I thought was nice. Fine, fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just questioning. And the the funeral party. Did you let it go, or did you say what should be happening? A combination. Um, yeah. I mean, I let the actors choose songs, which was, in the end, yes. problematic because we couldn't get rights to all of them. Uh, but yeah, I basically just assembled the people and placed them, and we shot on one plane, and I was able to sort of crawl around on the floor. There's also another room you don't see, so I could like get around outside and cue people and stuff like that. Uh, were they all non-actors, or some were acting? They were all non-actors. Non-actors. And how did you get away with them? Like, you asked them, they said yes at some point. Did you have to sign a release, do something like, to be sure you can do the film and show it somewhere? They accepted to sign the paper, that we classical thing, you know, yes. yellow. So you throw them into that, you throw them, and they said, do whatever you wish, or uh, I want you to be sad, or you want you to laugh. Or, you give a lot of indication, more or less? I, I uh, gave everybody a little biography of the fictional character who's died. And, uh, you know, I'd been meeting regularly uh, in anticipation of this other project. Um, this came together rather quickly. So with the biography, you know, I, which I gave to them when they arrived on set, it usually started a conversation. Um, I like to, to sort of direct the, the, the action first. So we would look at the space and place people, entrances, exits, and then save the dialogue for last. And, and it was usually, I would ask, you know, what, you know, you're over here stirring the coffee, what might you say to your mom? Or when, you, when, when your son enters, what could you say to him? And then uh, we'd start bouncing ideas back and forth. But sometimes they surprised me with dialogue that I didn't anticipate that they introduced when the camera was rolling. Some of the best stuff, I think. Like a scene very strong when she goes on the outside on the terrace and then comes the man. Mm -hmm. It's her father. I mean, the, ma the husband of her mother, is it? Yeah, it's her father. Um, yeah, and her mother, the idea is her mother lives in like right. Santa Monica. It's, it's not her father, it's the man. And yeah. I like the scene very much again and again. Did you ask him to push it like that way? Or? That's an interesting scene. Uh, Sky, the, the young woman, she didn't want to meet Spike, who was to play her father, yeah. before the scene. We'd been shooting in his house all day, and it was a long shoot. We wanted to try to get her on the balcony with him, mm. that magic hour. Uh, so we placed the camera on a neighboring fire escape, um, brought Sky into the apartment, um, told her where to stand out on the balcony. Uh, I told Spike that I would cue him to go outside, and uh, when he was ready to, to get away from her, he'd come back in. Um, we only did one take. 
because we didn't have time to do it's more. It's like many things that he comes back. Yeah. Back. Well, I pushed him back. He didn't want to go. So he came into the kitchen where I was hiding, and I was like, mm. that was great. You got to go back out. And he was like, I don't want to go back out. She's yelling at me. He didn't expect it. And he was like, I don't, this is making Why me. Why he didn't want to go? <laughs> because he didn't want to be yelled at. He didn't, didn't want to be? Yelled at. She was yelling, uh, yes, shouting yes, at him. Yes, yes. yes. She, 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 Oh, yeah. my God. That's when they're not actors, they have the real, yeah. real personal reaction. Then. Yeah, it made him really uncomfortable. Because it's very strong. He comes back, and she hates him in a way. And, yeah. and he stays. I mean, he, you feel like nervous because he says, when she says, get away, it doesn't go away. It's very strong, I felt. And I didn't know how much that was organized or it happened. It kind of happened. I think it was welling up for the actor, for Sky. Uh, her father in real life is estranged. She doesn't see him. Uh, she was drawing on that, I think. She was also not very happy on the production. I don't, I don't know, maybe it was a failure on my part, but... Um, she had been waiting all day to do this scene and we kept pushing it and then decided to shoot it at night. And she was, she, I think she was frustrated. She was a little scared of, of him as well. Uh, it's, it's not her, he's not her real stepfather. No. It's an, act, it's an acting. Yes. Yeah, I found it very strong. I have another question, if I may. I, I don't exactly understand the soundtrack. Mm. Like when they go at night in the house, in the place, why do we have a hell of a noise? Is it the road? Is it what? Why do we have the cello? No, no, before the cello. It's a very strong noise. Very loud. But what is it? It's a highway right near the house where we shot. But we didn't feel that it was a highway. No. Suddenly it becomes so strong. Yeah, it's right out there. But since it was so little, didn't want, why didn't you choose? Which, you chose what you chose, but why didn't you choose to make it silent? I don't know. I felt like uh, I wanted to. I like the sound of the p yes. physical spaces yes, where we so shot. Yeah, it's too it loud. It seems maybe. that it was quiet when they go into the street, mm -hmm. and the minute they enter that spooky house, mm -hmm. it's a hell of a noise. And I, I thought, did you want that to be like a pressure on them, or yeah. because they could have? We could not hear what they say. Right. That's true. So, was it on purpose? Yes. I guess so. Yeah, I don't know. I was. I would, I don't put. I don't think I put very much thought in it. Into it. I mean, the way that I took that was well, or before they're they're in the car, right? So they're isolated from from the noise of the highway nearby. Um, and in fact, that that scene where they enter the house, where it's very difficult to hear, uh, reminds me of the scene at the waterfall too, where there's this blend of the voices um, and the river. In this case, it's a blend of, of the voices and, and the highway. And I mean, to me, it has a lot to do with the way that you weave together uh, the person and the place, um, even on, on, on the level of sound. Um, and it also has to do with, of course, the, the sense of, the, of a slice of life, the sense of realism in the film, so that a lot of what they say is small talk and we don't necessarily need to know um, all, what, what, all the, what all the words are. That, that, that was sort of how I understood the sound there. Then there are also, you know, like, just we shot in some noisy locations and would like the dialogue to be a little cleaner than it is, but, you know, you do your best. And well, You chose subtitles for the scene in the tattoo parlor, for instance. Right. Yeah, uh, Joachim, and he's, he's a sound guy, too, and he's got the mic, so I don't if the... <laughs> I, I have another two questions for you. Uh, I understand that we, these people were non-actors, you gave them, you gave them more or less a uh, biography or something of the deceased guy, so they knew uh, uh, at least they had some indication of uh, this person, uh, uh, who's the reason for them gathering there and uh, joining in this funeral. But did you give them any precise clue, clues of who they were in the film, of who these characters were, or they just more or less? Uh, uh, played themselves in this situation. Did you uh, sort of com gave them? This is one question. The other question I have, uh, I'd like to ask you. If, uh, um, the whole film is uh, even because you also shoot uh, quite a lot in very close ups and uh, very close to the bodies and uh, to the people, and then you ha you have shots of space. Uh, uh, for me, uh, some of these locations actually, I I I I, uh, I built them in my head through the soundtrack, through the location sound. Mm -hmm. uh, 
this, I, I don't think this kind of, uh, the way of sh you could have a, a, a feeling of, of these spaces without uh, the soundtrack, which is much wider than what you see in the picture. But it's, it's all, um, I had this impression that uh, uh, most of the scenes are quite, uh, I wouldn't say dark, but uh, uh, there is some sort of sadness in the in the, in the images uh, in the in the locations, and the only bright moment is this sort of uh, uh, the funeral, the the funeral party, party, and at the same time, for, I, I think for most of us in Portugal, this is quite surprising because. Uh, uh, Probably it's, a, it's certainly also a cultural thing, but we don't leave funerals this way, or death. Uh, uh, so uh, I wonder if uh, there was a reason to. to uh, yeah. I mean, in terms of the uh, working with actors and the information that I gave them, it was usually about their relationship to the deceased uh, and to the other characters in the film. So uh, there were, you know. Uh, real family members uh, playing opposite one another, but then of course um, there were fictive relationships that w we were trying to imagine um, and support. So uh, it was usually it began with a conversation about like, you know, these are your friends. You haven't seen them in in this amount of time, or uh, this is your uh, little sister. Um, your older sister has been away in Delaware for you know eight months, this is her first time home for the funeral, that kind of thing. Uh, and I, I let the, the actors ask me, you know, for more, for more information. I try not to give them too much because I figured they would, uh, I trusted them they were going to draw from somewhere. If they had questions, they would ask. And some, some of them needed very specific answers and had uh, specific questions, but others kept it inside a little more. Um, Dustin, for example, who talks about uh, prison. Um, is drawing there from his own experience, uh, and uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't um, tell me he was going to. Though I, I knew what kind of questions to ask, he, uh, you know, he was comfortable kind of going there and, and speaking about um, this in some detail and, and keeping some of it uh, private. Uh, I think all the actors did that, more or less. Um, but uh, the karaoke wake, uh, that's not a tradition in the US either, it's, it's a fiction. <laughs> I mean, for me, it was a fa fabricated because I, I wanted to, I'm not, I wasn't interested in the funeral, but I was interested in the, what happens immediately after. And though I've never been to a wake where people sang karaoke, I have been to wakes where there was singing and laughter and a lot of drinking and a celebration of the deceased, as well as the, the, the sort of the, the mourning of, of the loss. So I, I wanted something that would palpably, emotionally combine this, 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 this dichotomy. So uh, it seemed like uh, this karaoke place could be the perfect, perfect opportunity to try. And I think it works nicely because it's maybe the closest we get to the characters in the film. Um, but the sound, it's, I, I started as a sound recordist when I was a student and a little bit after I finished school. And that's how I kind of got into production. Um, so I think a lot about sound. I've been lucky to work with uh, good location recordists. Um, now I have a developing relationship with this mixer in New York who I really like working with. And, um, as you say, it, uh, it's a way to, to, to evoke uh, everything that's outside of the frame. And uh, that's exciting, I think. In the beginning, of course, the film and, and the films that we have been seeing are more about situations than resolution, uh, and your film too. But at the beginning, you uh, you have this kid, and uh, you ask him where people would I go, and during the film, that kind of motive is, in fact, it's, it's present. Um, and they go to, the girls go to that uh, place. So in, in a way, it's, it's an answer. But the, my question is, uh, your thoughts for the film, why did you choose this kind of center of 
this idea of thinking about death and the afterlife as the center for the film? Um, it was personal. I was thinking a lot about my own death. Um, at that point, I had uh, a mar I was ending a marriage, and I had come. Uh, I was dealing with a lot of substance abuse, and thinking a lot about. Um, I don't know. Yeah, if I you know thinking about death. For me, imagining a way this character was like a void that I had been imagining occupying and so just sort of a surrogate for myself and a way to explore meaning and uh, uh, a way to sort of combat uh, the, the sort of this kind of self-destructive tendencies that I had, I had been developing at that time for a number of years. So it was like that, I guess. I was talking before with, with Rui, uh, we, like scientists, we have the tendency of always to compare, uh, you know, how we are. So we were uh, kind of comparing this this film with the skaters, with the films of Larry Clark and Gus Van Sant, and we came to the conclusion that yours is, of course, like more realistic. And uh, they, in, her, in their films, they like, their characters are more powerful and they, they focus more on the on the ballet, you know, or in the, on the, on the, the ritual, the rituals. But yours, of course, is more realistic and it has like a languid or sad tone, you know, like, like very, you know, the whole, the whole length of the film. So, but there are a couple of, of, of issues that, you know, suddenly light up. One is that uh, um, among all that realism, you chose one, uh, uh, let's call an independent music star, which I think maybe at the time she was, Sky Ferreira. Uh, and uh, the other one is the, the so, you know, kind of weird, weird uh, presence of the music of uh, Viola da Gamba, Jordi Sabal. So uh, these two things are like uh, two, you know, intruders into the realistic tone. So, well, if you could please develop on that or explain why did you... That's interesting. Um, I think you're right. Uh, for me, uh, casting Sky Ferreira was like a, an attempt to dip into, like reach into sort of, I don't know, pop culture a little bit. I mean, she hadn't been signed when we shot. She hadn't recorded an album. She just had this demo that she was like shopping around and people were starting to take notice in LA. Now she's doing really well. Um, but I took the advice of uh, John Waters. He was like, do you read the trades? You know, like Variety, Hollywood Reporter? I was like, no. He was like, I've been reading them every day since, I mean, every week since I was like 12 years old. You should read the trades. And then I was like, okay. So I got a subscription to Variety. And then he was like, you should read teen magazines. And I was like, I've never read a teen magazine. He was like, get teen magazines and look for the actors or musicians. It doesn't matter. And cast them in your film. So John Waters gave me the advice to read Teen Magazine. I got a Teen Magazine. Sky Ferreira was in it. It was a teen skateboard magazine, uh, so it was a little edgier. But uh, yeah, it was, I saw an interview with her, and I was like, okay, I'm going to contact her, and I did. Um, and I think that there's a way in which I would like to continue doing that, like working with, with people that, that uh, you know, have a, I don't know, have something like quantifiable that's like, contextually very different than the milieu, the dominant milieu of, the, of, a, of a particular film. Um, the music, uh, the Jordi Saval, was uh, introduced by my editor. Um, it was his idea. Uh, you know, I have a sort of, I'm cagey about uh, the use of score, but of course music, obviously you watch it, it's very important. I'm thinking about the song choices. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always imagined it would, the music would be diegetic. He found this um, while editing the skate park scene and, and thought it would be it would add something, and I think it does. So I try to listen when people have good ideas. <laughs> okay, some questions. Sure. Sure. Uh, would anyone like to raise a hand? Can you get fazer alguma pergunta? Ask anyone on our panel a question. Okay, there's a mic coming to you. Hi. 
Um, you talked about the interviews, and I would like to know if they, it was a concept, already a concept in there with your five pages, or if, if it came along, and how did you prepare for them? Um, it, it was in the, in the treatment, in the five pages. Um, I knew who I wanted to interview and where going in. Um, we usually shot everything and then saved the interview for last. Um, and we typically covered it in like a wide shot, did a couple takes of that, and then punched in for something closer. But we didn't rehearse. Um, I didn't give the actors the questions in advance. I wanted to keep it in line with the improvisational tone of, of the rest of the dialogue. So uh, sometimes it was hard to remember what I'd asked if we did another take, how to arrive in that same place. Uh, occasionally I would repeat a question, like not stop the interview, but if I asked something and the answer broke, like broke the fiction somehow, if like, I don't know, if the actor said, my sister, when I should have said his cousin type of thing, that I would say, I'm going to ask you again, but she's your cousin, and then we just, I'd ask again, that kind of thing. And I found that it was, it was, there's a way in which it felt like I was, it was just an extension of directing, but I was directing from within the scene, which was kind of nice. Uh, uh, and, it, and again, it was this kind of continuation of the conversations that we had been having uh, now, I guess at this point, for, for months, many of them began uh, at the time of the, the, uh, the actor's initial audition. Uh, you show us in America that it's totally demoralized. Um, where basically there's no ideas there's a total emptiness. Um, is that on purpose or is that a reality that you see in that kind of no, no redemption? I mean, there's no values, there's nothing. It's a totally kind of a lost space for kids. I mean, I, I agree that... Uh, yeah, the, the, the characters in, in this film are suffering from a kind of demoralization. I think you're, you're right about that. Um, a symptom of unemployment, underemployment, uh, a lack of options. But I would disagree that there's no meaning or hope or ideas. I mean, for me, one of the reoccurring themes uh, that really did come about kind of organically, but I think has a cumulative effect when you watch the film, is that there are a lot of, a lot of people that, that have a, a creative practice, um, whether that's BMXing or skating or tagging, graffiti, singing, um, you know, and, and that, has, that has meaning. Um, there's a community uh, which has meaning as well. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a depressed America in a lot of ways. Um, but I think uh, there's something else too. Okay. No, I was just wondering because yeah. it's, it's very bleak. I mean, yes, I mean, half of them were in jail. Half of them were dope dealers or doing dope. The guy who died, you know, there's a, I'm not saying it's not there because I think it is there but to show that kind of America when, you know, America is supposed to be the big, big, um, as you know. I mean, this is, yeah, this is my America. This is like, you know, what I know, I mean, it's, I was lucky. I, I grew up in this neighborhood. My parents are both teachers in the public schools. They sent me to a private school. I got a really good education. I know how to communicate. Uh, I think it opened up all kinds of opportunity for me. Um, that's why I'm able to make films. I'm in a very privileged position relative to uh, many, of the, many of the people that appear on screen in this film. Uh, it was important for me, after my 20s, living in New York, where I studied, to 
to try to make sense of this neighborhood, to go back to the place where I was born and, and, and make something collaborative. And uh, I think my first two features reflect that. It's as an adult trying to sort of, uh, yeah, represent something on screen that's maybe underrepresented, as you, as you totally, say. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, during the old film, I was thinking a lot about the relationship between cinema or film and television. Uh, because I really think that is a film that we could say that is a film only possible after television. You know, the question of interview, you know, and the way of filming and what we are watching today in a way is that you are watching television and you have a real good series that will say, oh, this is good cinema. You know, like the Danish, um, um, yeah, you know, all of them. So um, I would like that you explore a little bit, uh, and I'm sure that we have been thinking about this. Tell us a little bit about what you think that is the relationship between film and television and how television had changed film because usually we don't think about that, but I really believe that it changed. And your film, you are clearly using some, let's say, communication, communicational devices that came from television, the interview um, and other stuff, a kind of reportage, reportage, um, feeling, uh, turn off the lights of the car, okay, no lightning, just, you know, this kind of, so. so. I, mean, I think that's interesting, this idea of, of, of how television's changed film, it certainly has. Uh, I think as a filmmaker, I don't know if you would agree, that, but I believe we have like more freedom now than uh, maybe to explore form and narrative in different ways, at, le at least in the, in the US. Not to say that I'm seeing a lot of it, but people watch television. Everyone wants to be in television. Everyone wants to work in television in the States. There's this, uh, I would say this value right now on television, on the potential of television for like storytelling on a kind of epic scale. So there's a lot of talent there. And a lot of people that were working in film are going towards television, directors, writers, actors, producers. I kind of think that in the States, uh, there's going to be, of what it's going to clear out. There's actually going to not be anybody very, or there are going to be very few people making films anymore. Uh, I can really only speak about the US, but I, I feel like everyone's going to leave film and that's going to allow us to do whatever we want. Uh, at least that's my hope. <laughs> When you say everyone's going to leave film, but that will let us do. So who's the us left if everyone's left for television? Uh, the few who uh, aren't interested in storytelling necessary or in um, making money. I, I hope you're right. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, I, I just have a, one simple question. I, through the film, I had the feeling that we know more about these people than about the character who died, because we know he was a nice guy, everybody likes him. Uh, he overdosed probably, we don't know exactly. But none of the characters, apart, I, I think apart from the mother, but she's very silent, she's there, she doesn't... Uh, all the others, uh, you don't have a character who is his uh, girlfriend, who is... Uh, uh, stressed with pain or something they, they, they all have some distance uh, to, to this character and and so actually uh, you, you're closer to these people than to you're not trying to find out who this uh, dead person is uh, and you're not given many clues uh, during the but then at a certain moment at the funeral you do something which surprised me for me I, I wasn't expecting it and I think it's done on purpose because the camera stops on him. You, you show his picture, you, sh you show his image, and suddenly we have something to uh, uh, 
it materi materializes in front of us. So we finally, uh, uh, and I wonder uh, um, if this was uh, uh, in your five-page script, if, it, if this is, was a bit your idea, uh, and um, uh, how the fact that you show him uh, uh, might eventually change the relationship that we viewers have with the with the story and with the character. Yeah. It's interesting. I uh, it it wasn't um, in the scenario, but uh, that particular photograph was important to me because uh, though I don't know I don't know the young man in the photo, a friend of mine took it and I had been writing a role, uh, imagining. This young man, I do this a lot. Like I'll just take a photograph and like then, then somehow I can like, my mind is able to, to realize, uh, something, that I that my imagination can't sort of, um, independently. So I had been writing a character, looking at this photo as reference, um, and since my friend took it, uh, you know, it was it was a photo that was available to us. And, um, and so we chose to reproduce it. Um, I like that it's, it's fair. It's like, uh, it plays kind of like an archetype. He's very handsome. He's, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's from a fashion shoot. It does, it doesn't look like a part of the world really, but I wanted something to really, that really popped. I wanted a, a, an image that, that resonated. Uh, so yeah, we chose that one. Um, got his permission as well. And then at our premiere in Berlin, uh, the first question, this is in like a room full of, I don't know, 700, 700 800 people. Someone raises their hand and, and says, uh, thank you for the film. I had uh, no idea that uh, so-and-so, the young man in the photo, had died. He's an old friend. And uh, uh, I just want to thank you for this tribute. <laughs> and I, I just say, I'm sorry, wait. Here's the wait. Here's the, here's the real story. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. I mean, oh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, my question is born out of this sequence Anya told before, told you before about uh, the um, Sky Ferreira Jenny crying out, you know, in the in the balcony. Um, my question is very simple. Do you have any particular rule or moral idea of when to cut a shot or not? Because it's yeah. very long, yeah, and it really, it's like maybe it stands out. I like the maybe in 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 our inner uh, senses, like the longest of the of the film, and it's you know, maybe you are waiting for something else to happen. Or... Yeah, I mean, I, that shot was debated uh, furiously and and uh, for for a long time. Um, I always wanted it to play out in the duration in which it appears because I think what happens is, you know, kind of maybe with it emotionally, it, in size, her performance there is like much bigger than anything else in the film. When he goes inside uh, and he stays inside for a little while, uh, I think the expectation, the viewer's expectation is that we're, we're going to cut. When he comes back outside, I think it pushes it in an interesting way further. Um, I like the potential for duration to push audiences away and, and pull them back. I mean, I think it's like a device and it's, uh, it's yeah, it's one I like to, to use. I mean, there were, there were a lot of people, um, not my editor, he was on my side, but like, you know, a lot of people connected to the project, people I respect were like, you got to cut this, this scene is, it's, it, you know, it's, it hits a false note in the second half I don't believe it anymore. It's too long. You take me out of it. But I don't know. I think it it does a twist there that that it wouldn't if we we cut earlier. And that's what I like about it. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions? Uh, yes, there's a, a question up there. Um, thank you for the film, uh, and also the honesty of uh, you telling us your personal situation. It's, it's nice. So um, my question is, if uh, 
when you thought about uh, doing this movie, um, you had a, a, an idea of a movie and uh, since you know this place so well, you sort of match it. It was easier for you because you know this place so well. Or um, it was the other way around. You know this place so well that you felt that there was a story to be told. And of course, um, please understand, I'm Portuguese, I'm European, I don't know the um, American reality so well. So, so I'm pretty sure there's a lot of little things that makes this movie a Baltimore movie and not uh, a Boston movie, for instance, you know. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I agree with you on both points. Um, uh, I make, you know, I make, I, as I said earlier, make films in this neighborhood where, where I grew up because through the process I understand it better. Um, uh, so it's as much for me or more for me in the community than, than it is for the audience, though I'm thinking about the audience as well. I do believe, I don't know, I think it was, probably, he probably wasn't the first to say it, but I, I remember a title card in Jonas Mekas's, uh as I was moving ahead, um, I occasionally saw brief glimpses of beauty that is one of his epic films. There's a title card that talks about, you know, the, the local as universal, and I believe that. I mean, it, uh, it's pithy, but I think true. So, yeah, you're right that, that these, you know, that, that these types of characters exist in a lot of American cities and in other parts of the world. Um, to answer your second question, uh, yeah, we start. I started with, um, again, this a number of locations, uh, places I wanted to shoot, people I wanted to shoot with, and then shape to try to come up with a little a narrative that would allow me to bring all these disparate lives together. So, um, I guess what's Baltimore about it? I mean, specific locations, you know, which resonate for people that are from the place, probably more, you know, as like as unique when you recognize your own city on screen, it has meaning. Um, but I think maybe the, you know, the dialect, the, the, like the way of speaking is, is uh, specifically, with the exception of one or two actors, Baltimore. Um, have, you seen the, have you seen the film de Patrice Chéreau called Ceux qui m'aiment prendront train? Those who loved me will take the train. Oh, yes. No, I've never seen and it. And they, they take a train to go to the funeral. And a lot happens in the train. But little by little, establish the relationship. And it becomes like something very, like a storm of truth and hate and love that becomes, again, just before the funeral. It's the same dispositive, the same setup, but very different because it's very active there. It's very written as a crisis, when the flavor, I mean, flavor, I don't know, if, the charm of your film is that we feel that it's true, that it's really love. his father, the sister. I believe that, like a documentary anyway, as if you had been invited to meet a real family. I found it very strongly true, which brings the subject of realism. Even you fake it, but it, it's a realistic film. Effect. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to briefly talk about the sense of place. I mean, I guess for me, what I was thinking when I when I introduced it as a portrait of a place. It's true that, of course, there are many places like uh, like the part of Baltimore that we see, which is sort of exurban, you could say, and lower lower middle class. Um, but I felt like in the in the course of the film, we get a sense of uh, a, a particularity. Um, uh, it's sort of what you're saying about the, the, the local is the universal, that there is a sense between the landscapes that we see um, and this group of people that we get a sense of a place, not necessarily of the city of Baltimore, um, but that, that we feel somehow that we are, that we visited a situation that has a certain lo location, uh, a landscape. And I would say the same, I've never been to the, 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 the Portuguese countryside and I've never been to set, um, but the strengths of those two films are to give us a sense 
Um, and it's true that maybe Set could be an, another fishing villages on, uh, all along the, the French Mediterranean. Um, Right. <laughs> okay. But I mean, I guess, I guess uh, for me, it gives me a sense of, of there being this sort of intersection of place and person um, that's very specific uh, uh, and is not necessarily sort of uh, socio geographic, um, but it's also partially aesthetic. And in a way, it goes back to this question of television uh, in the sense that I think that's something that an image uh, or, or a medium like cinema that, uh, that brings us a large image. With, uh, that has a duration that allows us to spend time in a place and with people, and that doesn't have to rush to the next situation the way the, the, the smaller image of television does. I mean, in a way, maybe portrait and landscape is what's left when the, all of the stuff that's the narrative uh, has been drained away. Um, you know, Pasolini has this essay, The Cinema of Poetry, where he talks about uh, the, this idea that the, the bourgeois cinema is the cinema that has to tell a story. But that underneath that, um, if you take away the storytelling, you can still get to some of the, 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 the beauty uh, of early cinema, for instance. And th this idea that, like, that narrative is sort of covered, paved over, if you will, um, what, what, what can be beautiful about cinema. And there's a way in which I think that the three of you, the work of the three of you reminds us of this cinema of poetry that, that exists underneath, underneath the narrative. You wanted to feel, fulfill your theme. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so any more questions? It's been a long time. Thank you very much, and my thanks to the three of you.